Good morning, Grace Bible Church. Normally I would say it's good to see you and it's good to be together as the people of God, but I am speaking to a room full of empty pews right now. In God's wise providence, we're not able to gather together as a church. But aren't you grateful for technology that allows us to gather in our homes for prayer and around God's word? Um, it's certainly not the same as the church gathered, but what a blessing it is uh, at this time. Um, some of you have asked when we're gonna be able to meet together again. And the simple answer is we just don't know yet. Uh, we are uh, actively monitoring the situation. And as soon as we're able, we will gather again on the Lord's day as a church. And so I would encourage you, uh, pray that that, would, that time would come sooner rather than later. Um, we all are looking forward to being together as God's people once again. For now, I, I want us to turn our attention to God's word. And the scripture reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 63. I'll be reading verses seven to 14. And since I can't hear the rustling of the pages stop, I'll give you a, a second, a few seconds to turn there. Um, I myself, when I'm at home watching these videos, realized how quickly we move on to the next step. So Isaiah chapter 63, Beginning in verse seven, I'll read down through verse 14. This is the word of the Lord. I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has granted us, and the great goodness to the house of Israel that he has granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely, and he became their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old of Moses and his people where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put in the midst of them his Holy Spirit, who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses, who divided the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name, who led them through the depths? Like a horse in the desert, they did not stumble. Like livestock that go down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord gave them rest, so you led your people to make for yourself a glorious name. Thus far, the reading of God's word, may he add his blessing to it. Let's join our hearts together in prayer now. Our Father in heaven, majestic is your name. From the rising of the sun to its setting, your name is to be praised. Lord of heaven above, you are God and you alone. You are the eternal God from whom, through whom, and for whom are all things. We give all praise and honor and glory to you. We ask that you would hear our prayers this morning in the name of Jesus, for we come through him. He is our great high priest. He is our intercessor and our mediator. Enable us by the power of your Holy Spirit to offer our prayers to you with the confidence that your, your ear is open to us, with trust that you are willing and able to answer us in a way that best brings you glory and does us everlasting good. Our Father in heaven, we rejoice in the great privilege we have to call you our Father through Jesus Christ, your Son, how amazing is the love that you've lavished on us that we should be called children of God. We rejoice that we call upon you not merely as individuals, but as members of a great family that transcends race, nationality, gender, and even time. Our Father in heaven, our prayer this morning is that your name would be hallowed, that your name would be glorified among us and throughout the world. May we treat your name as holy. May our, th our thoughts, our words, and our deeds reflect your holiness. 
Our Father in heaven, you are a great king, and even now you reign over all, but we pray, let your kingdom come. May it come in all its fullness. Hasten the day when Christ returns and all evil is banished forever, and the earth is filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. As we worship in your presence today, O oh God, may we anticipate living before you in the world to come. We pray that your kingdom would advance in this world through the preaching of the gospel. Enable us as a church to faithfully proclaim the good news here in Escondido. Help us to be winsome and gracious witnesses to the gospel with our friends, with our neighbors, with our families. Give us creativity in how we can go about that at this time that we're um, under stay-at-home orders. Father, we pray that you would open the eyes and the ears of those with whom we speak. Grant them faith and repentance. Oh Lord, we pray that you would bless the work of our missionaries and partners in missions. We think this morning of the Leightons, the Barcelos and the Phillips in Spain, the Kalenas in Germany, the Weavers in Canada, our friends in Israel. Plant your gospel deep in the hearts of the men and women to whom they minister. We pray that you would keep these families safe from the virus that's wreaking havoc on our world. We think especially of Elizabeth Barcelo. Continue to grant her health and strength as she recovers. Our Father in heaven, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us grace to know and to do your will. Sanctify us, O God. Enable us to love and obey your commands as people who have been raised to new life with Christ. As people who are indwelt by your Holy Spirit, may we delight in your law. Our Father in heaven, give us today our daily bread. We've been reminded in recent weeks that grocery stores with overflowing shelves are not a given. We thank you for this reminder of our dependence on you. You are the great provider, and so we ask you to supply us with what we need. May we share the resources you've given us with those among us who have lost jobs, with those who may um, have had their hours reduced. Grant healing to those who are sick and suffering. We think of Tom's sister Bridget and her husband Paul. We think of April, April Curry's father Walter and other family members and friends who have been infected with the coronavirus. May they put their trust wholly in you. May they rest in your wisdom and your sovereignty and your goodness. May those who don't know you think about the certainty of death, the brevity of life, the certainty of standing before you to give an account, and may they see in Jesus Christ a savior from sin. May they turn to him in repentance and trust. Our Father in heaven, we ask that you would forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. You've created us and recreated us to live in true righteousness and holiness, but we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, in word, in deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. If you were to keep a record of our sins, who could stand before you? But with you, there is forgiveness that you may be feared and loved and trusted. We thank you for Jesus' perfect sacrifice for our sins. We praise you that we have received full forgiveness of our sins, past, present, future, May we have full assurance that our guilt has been taken away and that we stand before you clothed in the spotless righteousness of Jesus Christ. As evidence that our sins have been forgiven, give us grace to forgive those who have wronged us. By your spirit, enable us to put off bitterness, to put off anger and hardness of heart. Make us kind and tender-hearted people. Work in us so that we might forgive others as you have so graciously forgiven us in Christ. And may the gentleness, the humility, and the forgiveness of Christ characterize us as a church. Our Father in heaven, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. 
Keep us from walking right into temptation's path. Lead us into paths of truth and righteousness for your namesake. Guard us from the evil one. Help us to stand against his evil schemes. Strengthen us to stand firm in your truth. Enable us to battle doubts and fears and worry with your great and precious promises. We ask that you would protect and preserve us for heavenly glory. Our Father in heaven, we bring these requests to you because yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. You've promised to grant our, requ our requests when we ask in Jesus' name. So fulfill now the desires of our hearts, for we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit is eternally praised. Amen. Well, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 13. We're going to be looking today at chapters 13 and then through chapter 14. As you're turning there, I want to begin with a question. Do you like to think about what it would be like to live in different times? I must confess that for myself, as I thought about history and historical events, what often comes to mind is, yeah, that happened, but I don't really see it as all that re relevant to my daily life. But lately, events like World War II, the Great Depression, Spanish influenza, have all seemed a lot more interesting and relevant. I've been wondering more and more what it was like to actually live during that time. What was it like to experience those things? What restrictions were placed upon people and, and how did they respond? Well, we can do that with historical events sometimes, but I think a major problem happens when we do the same thing with the Bible. We can read stories that we may know very well, like today's passage of crossing the Red Sea. And we think, yeah, that happened, but it feels very different from our daily life. Um, we don't feel like we're being driven out of Egypt or chased by chariots. And so we may not really think of what it was like to actually experience the victory of the deliverance of the Red Sea. But you see, the Bible tells us that the Old Testament isn't just a set of stories for us to affirm, but the Apostle Paul tells us that it was our fathers who passed through the sea. And these things that happened to them as an example were actually written for our instruction as well. And so today, even though most of us know the end of the story of what happens at the Red Sea, what I want to do is us examine it as it unfolds in the text and for us to think of what it was like to experience God's victory and God's deliverance as his people trusting him at that time. Because the Exodus was a powerful display of how God saves his people. It was a foreshadowing and a patterning in many ways of God's ways of deliverance. And so as we look at how the Israelites were delivered, it also tells us much about the victory plan that God is unfolding in our lives as well. And so let's pray that the Lord would help us as we look at his word, and then we'll take a look at these passages together. Our Father, we ask for help by your Holy Spirit as we turn to these passages in your word. We pray that you would give us ears to hear your truth. We pray that you would give us hearts to see and believe in who you are and how you work victory in all of human history for your glory and for the good of your people. Strengthen our faith, we pray this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we finished last time with the instructions about how Israel is to commemorate the Lord's deliverance in both the redemption of the firstborn and in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so now what happens is we resume the action as the people are leaving Egypt. And we see this in Exodus chapter 13 uh, in verses 17 to 22. And the first thing that we notice in this passage is that the Lord's victory is according to plan. His victory is according to plan. So as we read through this together, notice all of the details of the Lord's plan for his people. It says this in Exodus 13, starting in verse 17. 
when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry my bones with you from here. And they moved on from Sukkoth and encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. And so all throughout this Exodus account, as we come now uh, deep into chapter 13, we've been hearing of God's plan to deliver his people over and over again. Details are reiterated, in particular throughout the plagues. Well, now that deliverance has happened and the people are coming out of Egypt, Pharaoh lets the people go, immediately we learn that the Lord is still leading his people according to his plan. And notice what this kind of transitional paragraph tells us about God's forethought. The first thing that we see is that his victory plan accounts for their weaknesses. His victory plan accounts for their weaknesses. Right from the start, God is leading them in a particular direction and in a particular way. And the text tells us that it's not the quickest way or the most direct route to Canaan, but it, it, and it wasn't the way that was near. Instead, it's the way of the wilderness. And why is it that God is leading them on the way of the wilderness? Well, the text tells us that it's because they were not yet ready for war. That most direct route would have certainly resulted in confrontations with some of those strongest military foes of the day. And the Lord knows that the people were not ready for this. They're coming out equipped for battle or in battle array. They're coming out as the Lord's army, but he knows that they're far from ready to handle the reality of fighting for the Lord even as he goes out before them. And he knows that they would be tempted to return to Egypt if they were to encounter these foes. And so instead, he leads them a different way. Isn't it fascinating that the Lord doesn't say, oh, they would encounter these foes, but I'll show them. They just need to get tougher. They just need to have more faith. And so let's go that hard and difficult way. Instead, he understands what they can handle at this point in their journey. And he plans accordingly. And he leads them another way for their good. And so we see in the Lord's victory plan, he's accounting for their weaknesses. But then secondly, we see that his victory plan also keeps every promise. There's this detail in it that can seem strange to us, right? In verse 19, it tells us that they came out with Joseph's bones. And if you think of all that's happening in this situation, in particular for Moses, as he's going before Pharaoh time after time, he's talking to the elders of Israel, he's talking to the Lord, and then the Lord's leading them out and they're leaving in haste. With all of that going on, this very important detail takes place. Moses brings Joseph's bones with them. And this is how the book of Genesis, the book of Israel's beginnings, comes to a close. It's, it's quoted here almost word for word, Genesis 50, 25. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. And you see what we find is that in God's victory plan, no detail, no matter how small, is overlooked. No promise is not kept. Even this plan and promise to bring Joseph's bones with them. And we also notice that his victory plan includes his presence. Notice verses 21 and 22. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. So what we have here is we're introduced to a manifestation of the Lord's presence among his people. 
During the day, he's with them as a pillar of cloud, and by night, a pillar of fire, so that they can know where to go, perhaps even providing shade during the heat of the day and light and warmth by night as they travel. But notice in the text, it's not just that God sent this pillar to be among them. Instead, actually, he was with them in the pillar. We find this later on in our passage. In, in chapter 14, verse 19, the pillar of fire and cloud is associated with the angel of God, much like we found in the burning bush earlier in chapter 3. In chapter 14, verse 24, the Lord is described as in the pillar of fire and cloud, and from being in that pillar, he looks down upon what is taking place. And so what we find as the scriptures reveal to us the nature of this pillar is that to speak of the pillar of fire and cloud was to speak of the Lord's presence itself. He himself was with them. And it seems that what's happening is we're seeing God's Trinitarian presence really there in shadowy form already. It's the Lord's presence, the Father with his people. It's closely associated with the messenger of God, who most likely was the pre-incarnate son. And as we saw from our scripture reading today, the cloud is clearly associated with the Spirit's presence, as the Spirit was with them, leading them, guiding them in the wilderness. And so while that's fascinating theologically to think about the Trinitarian God's presence among his people, the real point is found there in verse 22. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. He remained with them, leading them, guiding them, later protecting them through the pillar. And so as we notice right away that the Lord's victory is according to this plan, we're reminded that no part of our journey as the people of God is outside of the Lord's victory plan either. It may sound much different as we live our current lives as believers in this world, but God's provisions for us are no less than they were for the Israelites. If we think about it, he knew their weaknesses and led them accordingly. And so also, he knows our weaknesses and cares for us accordingly. The psalmist says that he knows our frame. He remembers that we are but dust. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, when Paul's speaking of the temptations that are common to man, he speaks of God's awareness of what we're able to bear, and he speaks of God's faithfulness to consistently provide ways of escape so that we may bear up under these temptations. He knows our weaknesses. And the author to the Hebrews speaks of our Lord Jesus as our great and faithful high priest who knows what it was like to be tempted in every way and yet without sin. And we can draw near to him for help in our very weakness. And so he knows what our weaknesses are, and he leads us along the right and proper way for our good even now. And not only does he know our weaknesses, but he keeps every promise. As surely as Joseph's bones would be led out of Egypt and buried one day in the promised land, so also God's promise that our very bodies will be resurrected in the new heavens and the new earth. That will surely come to pass. And he will also keep every detail and every promise along the way. As in our Lord Jesus Christ, every promise of our God is yes and amen in him. Not only does he keep every promise, but just as he was with Israel every step of the way, so also he is with us. You know, I read this story and I think, boy, wouldn't it be great if during the day you just follow along this pillar of cloud or at night a pillar of fire? Surely I would know the Lord is with me. Surely I would trust in his guidance. But do you realize that Everything that this pillar of cloud and fire makes manifest about the presence of God is ours on an even greater scale. The triune God continues to lead us even now as his people. The Father has planned our redemption and is orchestrating all of history according to it. Jesus, our good shepherd, leads us by his word. 
And isn't it interesting that the word of God is spoken of as the light that it gives to us as it guides us along the way. It's a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. The Apostle Peter says that the word of God is a lamp that's shining in a dark place, leading the way for us. And the same spirit who was with them in the wilderness, who was in their midst, is now the very spirit of God who indwells us both individually and corporately as the Lord's people. And through him, God says to us that he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And so what we see is that God's victory is always according to plan. And we have the same benefits of that victory plan, even as we walk through the Christian life here and now. And so we've looked at this victory plan a bit, but then what I want us to notice secondly is what it feels like to experience the Lord's victory on the ground. How that victory works out in time and space. And we see that as we come to our next point in chapter 14. And what we find is that the Lord's victory often seems confusing. The Lord's victory often seems confusing to us. Notice with me verses 1 through 4 of chapter 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pihahiroth between Migdol and the sea. In front of Baal Zephon, you shall encamp, facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, They are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And so what we find here right away are the Lord's instructions on their journey. The Lord gives Moses instructions on their movements. And did you notice what, what those are? He has them turn back and encamp. Think of how strange this must have been for the people. Everything up until this point had been about going away from Egypt, continuing on towards the wilderness and, and the promised land ultimately. And now his instructions are that they go backwards. And instead of going and going and going, it's, it's go backwards and, and camp, set up camp, and set up camp by the sea, where there's one less place to go because you're hemmed in by the waters. And there's this reassurance here. He's going to harden Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh's going to pursue them. He'll get the glory. But what I think is important for us to notice at this point is although there's a promise of deliverance and of the Lord's victory, there are no details of how this is going to unfold for the people. And so if I were Moses, or if I were the people, I'd be very confused as the Lord's leading us towards this supposed victory that's coming. It's a very precarious and strange situation. But notice how Pharaoh and the Egyptians respond to this as it unfolds in verses 5 through 9. It says in verse 5, When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed towards the people. And they said, What is this that we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camped by the sea, by Pihahiroth in front of Baal Zephon. So what we find happening here is that Pharaoh gets word of the Israelites' change of direction. And if you remember, there are Egyptian outposts all along the way with the Israelites' path out of Egypt. And so word comes back to him, and he concludes that they're wandering confused and that the wilderness has now been their undoing. It has shut them in and he sees an opportunity to pursue them in the midst of their supposed confusion. And so what he does is he amasses his mightiest force. 
his chariot fleet. And it tells us a fleet of 600 of his best chariots and perhaps many more. And it's repeated here twice as chariots and horses and army and officers. It's repeated all throughout this um, text to emphasize how outmatched the Israelites are by this really the greatest army of the day. And instead, the Israelites, where are they? They're encamped. They're not ready to even move, much less are they ready for battle. And they're in the worst location possible, encamped by the sea. And so now, we get to hear the Israelites' experience of God's unfolding plan as we look at verses 10 and following. It says, when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And so notice the Israelites' perspective and, and their experience of how the Lord's leading this victory. After changing direction and now setting up camp, they lift their eyes to the most terrifying sight. The mightiest army in the world at that time is bearing down on them. They went out leaving defiantly. It says they left with their hands raised. And so raised in cheering, raised in victory. And I think also what it's saying is raised in some, I told you so of how great the Lord is. Now they've gone from hands raised to crying out in terror and outright fear. You see, their experience of God's plan for deliverance was actually terrifying. They feared greatly. They're overwhelmed. They're completely outmatched. And they can't think of one possible way that this plan could work out in any way other than just complete tragedy. And their response shows how fear-driven their thinking is. They say, are there no graves in Egypt? And we almost should just stop and, and laugh at what they said because Egypt is a land that's full of graves. It's the land of the pyramids. There are plenty of graves in Egypt. But then they say, we're going to die. And surely, as the Egyptians would overtake them, some of them would die in a show of force by the Egyptians, but their whole goal was to re-enslave the people. And that's exactly what the people are wanting to have happen. Let's go back to being slaves. And they blame Moses completely for what's taking place, and they leave the Lord out of the picture altogether. And so here what we find is that as the people are following the Lord's plan for victory, it's confusing to them at best, and it's terrifying at worst. Do God's ways ever seem confusing to you? Do his ways ever seem terrifying? This experience that they're going through is not new. They know that he will deliver them. He's promised to do it, but he hasn't told them how. And as they don't know how it's going to happen, they find it terrifying. You see, for them, it was an unexpected change of direction. All of a sudden, they seemed to be going backwards. Have you ever had that happen in your life? Maybe you're just starting to get caught up on your finances and the pandemic reduced your income or you lost your job. Maybe you're just starting to get some, some rhythms of life of how to live in a, in a way of, of good stewardship before the Lord and now it's shelter in place. Maybe you felt like you're making progress as a Christian and then suddenly you find yourselves feeling like you've taken 10 steps backwards, whether that's in your struggle of anger or fear or pride or gluttony or lust. It feels like you're going backwards. Maybe your marriage or your parenting seemed survivable, but then now in the midst of all this, you wonder how you'll even make it. And you see, for the people of Israel, they, they lifted up their eyes and the mightiest army in the world was bearing down on them. Have you ever had a time when the thing that you feared the most all of a sudden appeared 
on the horizon. Whether that's the, the diagnosis for yourself or for one you love, whether it's the rebellion of a child or the betrayal of a spouse or a friend. And like the Israelites, you feel caught totally unaware. They had just set up camp and their back is now pinned against the wall. And you find yourself unable to think of any way out of this. You find yourself completely outmatched and your cries for help don't even make sense. And perhaps you feel like God is nowhere to be found. And yet, as with them, the Lord meets us even in this and assures us of final victory. And none of that has changed. You see, this experience of the Israelites' confusion was not outside of his plan, but was actually a part of it. But it's what it felt like to be involved in the unfolding of his victory. And we find that that is often what our experience is like. But part of the beauty of having these things recorded for us is that this account, account lets us see the end of the story. It shows us the outcome that the Lord was working toward. And, and as we see what he was working toward, it gives us perspective of what we need to know in the midst of the confusion. Because what it shows us is that the victory that God is working is always more glorious than we imagine. And that's what we notice in our final point. The Lord's victory is always more glorious than we imagine. And what I want to do is just read the rest of our text, verses 13 through 31, as in many ways, this is the climax of the entire first 14 chapters of the book of Exodus. And it's just beautiful as it unfolds. And, and as you hear it, or as you follow along, listen for the ways God's glory is shown, both in how he judges his enemies and in how he saves his people. So let's hear together. Chapter 14, verses 13 and following. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you only have to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. Of all the host of Pharaoh that had fallen, followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand 
and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. Wow. <laughs> Do you think any of the Israelites had imagined something so amazing taking place in this victory? I can pretty much guarantee you the answer is no. And a lot of the reason that the answer is no is because they didn't understand all of the ways that the Lord was showing his glory in this deliverance at the Red Sea. You see, this is a story, this is an account about the glory of God being put on display. All throughout the opening chapters of Exodus, the Lord has made it clear that he is orchestrating all of these things in such a way that his glory will be made known. Remember Pharaoh's arrogant statement, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? And the Lord later in chapter nine explains that this gradual unfolding of the plagues against Pharaoh and the Egyptians was so that they would know that there is none like the Lord in all the earth. And here, did you notice it in chapter 14, how repeatedly God says, I will get glory over Pharaoh and over all his hosts and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. You see, the Lord was doing this so that his glory would be put on display. The Lord is glorious. He is supreme over all. He's preeminent. He's worthy of adoration and honor and praise by all of creation. And he orchestrates all of history so that his greatness is put on display. And some see it and reject it, but for his people, they see it and they worship him. And so I want us to see just how his glory is put on display. There are so many ways here, but just kind of in two forms. One, as it's put on display in his judgment against the Egyptians, and then in the salvation for his people. In his judgment against the Egyptians, we know that all throughout the plagues, we have seen the Lord's power over nature. He has power over the water and land and air and insects and frogs and locusts and thunderstorms and hail and darkness and light and even light and death. But here, he shows his power over the sea. And there are a few things that are significant about what's going on here that we may not immediately think of. The first is that in showing his power over the Red Sea, he shows his power as an international God. One of the things that Pharaoh may have thought when he saw the Egyptian or the Israelites wandering around in the wilderness is that the Lord was no longer with them or that the Lord no longer had power out in the wilderness. You see, in very much of the religious thinking of the day, the gods were very territorially bound or geographically limited. Yes, the Lord may have been able to do amazing things in Egypt to get his people out, but in delivering Israel out of Egypt and at the Red Sea, he shows his power and his greatness on a much grander scale as no boundary is able to come against him. And he shows his power here over the sea. You know, that may not be a very big deal for most of us. We are familiar with boats and bridges and tunnels and ways to get around water, but we don't understand the significance of the sea uh, to the Old Testament mindset. The sea was often viewed as a, a mythic monster, as the forces of chaos that were just waiting to swallow you alive. And no one in their right mind would have ever thought of going through the sea. And yet the Lord shows his power over the sea. It bows to his command and it brings life and deliverance to his people. And it does his bidding by bringing judgment against his enemies. And he shows his power so thoroughly in all of this over his enemies. The mightiest military force of that day is destroyed. 
And did you notice that, yes, God used nature and he used the sea, but he also used his power against them directly as well. Did you notice there what happens to his chariots? You know, we may read and think, oh, the Egyptians are chasing them on these rickety chariots. Of course, they're going to have trouble as they come into some bumps as they're going through uh, the Red Sea. But we forget that these chariots were the most advanced war machines of the day. And the Lord makes them unusable. And he attacks them directly. He, he attacks their wheels in some way. And we're not sure. The translations, it's ambiguous there whether the wheels come off altogether or they're just bent and make them undrivable. But did you notice that the Egyptians don't cry out and say, oh man, who forgot to maintain our chariots? No, they know exactly what's happening as the Lord strikes their chariots. And they say, let us flee from before Israel for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. And so by the end of chapter 14, the Lord has systematically shown that there is none like him in all the earth. The most powerful economy in the world is ground to a halt. The most powerful army in the world is wiped out and washing up on the shore. And the most powerful man in the world the one who was supposed to be able to hold back and control chaos, the one who was supposed to keep prosperity in the land as he represented and even was one of the gods, he's overtaken by the waters of chaos who do the bidding of the Lord God. And so the Lord's victory is one that showed forth his glory in his judgment over his enemies. But his glory is not only seen in his judgment, it's also seen in the salvation that he brought to his people through this victory plan. He shows his glory in their salvation. You know, if you think of being the Israelites and being delivered out of Egypt, I doubt that many of them even had time to think through the implications of their deliverance. I doubt that many of them had even thought through what happens if we go out of Egypt and then Pharaoh changes his mind and he comes after us with the mightiest army in the world. But do you realize that throughout this entire ordeal, the Lord is showing them that not only did he bring them out of slavery, but he was actually giving them something far greater. He was giving them new life as his people. As Moses describes this Red Sea crossing, he uses language that recalls intentionally, I believe, the, the first three creation days. When we think of the pillar of fire and of cloud, and as it moves and it separates the Egyptians from the Israelites, and darkness on one side and, and light on the other, we're reminded of day one of creation when darkness and light are separated. And then Moses makes it clear that the waters are divided from the waters by this east wind as happened on the second day. And then as the waters are separated, what happens? Dry land appears as it did in day three of the creation account. You see, the Lord was showing his people that this was a new creation, a new birth event for them. Before this, his people knew that their salvation was a deliverance from bondage and enslavement. But here he's showing that the Lord has something far greater in mind. In delivering his people, he's giving them new life and ultimately life that would be with him in the promised land. And so as we just think of some of these things that are glorious about the Lord's deliverance, we can kind of start to see why his plan might seem confusing to us, can't we? Because we understand so little of the many ways he's displaying his glory through his victory over his enemies and in the salvation he's bringing to us. And the details of how that deliverance would happen don't come until verse 14 of chapter 14. And so there's so much that in the experience of it, we can find confusing, but it's working towards something beyond what we can even imagine. And this shouldn't really surprise us, right? Because as scripture continues to unfold, we see that God's deliverance in the Exodus has foreshadowed his ultimate deliverance through Jesus Christ. 
and God's victory plan in the Exodus seemed very confusing. But the gospel and what Jesus did seems confusing to us, and it surely was confusing to the disciples at the time. You see, in his plan for redemption, Jesus underwent the waters of judgment that we deserved. He, the Son of God, the sinless one, underwent the judgment of the waters coming over him all the way to death itself. And yet in that act, all of our enemies thought that it was their certain moment of victory. But through his death and through his resurrection, he has made for his people a path through the waters. He has set us free and he has delivered us from our enemies and he has now brought us new life. And it's ultimately not merely life in Canaan, but eternal life in the new heavens and the new earth. You see, the Exodus really is a paradigm. It's an example of, of God's deliverance that shows us what God is doing even now. In many ways, our situation is much like the Israelites on the banks of the Red Sea, with our enemies clearly in view. We have been delivered through the work of Christ, but we're awaiting that final victory. We've heard that victory is coming. It's been promised to us, but we don't know the details of how it will all work out. And right now, where we are, it feels confusing and often terrifying. But we have the same promise that Moses gave to the people. He says, the enemies you see today, you will never see again. Sin, that though it has been defeated by the work of Christ, so often feels so strong in our lives. Death, whose grasp feels like it will never truly be shaken from us. And, and Satan, whose war against us is unrelenting, will all be done away with one day. You see, right now we have the assurance that God is using the sea, he's using evil, he's using sin, he's using chaos for his purposes of glory and our good. But do you realize that he has promised us that one day the sea will be no more? And all of these enemies that we see today, we will never see again. And so Moses' call to the people is also a call to us. Fear not, stand firm, see the salvation of the Lord. The Lord will fight for you. Our Lord Jesus has fought for us in the cross, and he will continue to fight for us until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And so we are called to now respond. As Israel responded, they saw what the Lord did for them. They feared him and they trusted him. And so may the Lord give us grace to follow him now through the sea as he leads us to our final deliverance one day. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for this amazing plan for victory that you have and have had from eternity and that you are working out now in time and space and that, that we are a part of and that we will one day see the glory of when our Lord Jesus returns and when all is made right. We pray that you would help us to remember the way that this experience may feel to us, but the truths about what you are actually doing and the glory that you are showing. And will you enable us to trust you, to walk in obedient faith on the path that you are leading us, to that final victory. We ask for strength of faith to do this. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.